Um, not only, as you heard, it's a great background, I'm also hoping that to get some golf lessons from him uh, going forward. So, uh, as mentioned, I handle all the research that we do as far as surveying for our company. There's some clubs in the room that I've administered, your member survey, also your employee survey, so I'm excited to be in front of you all, but also meet some of the new faces here. Um, I come from my whole life then essentially in clubs. Uh, my mother wasn't a general manager at a club, but I grew up belonging to a blue collar club. I was a kid charging the ice cream sandwich every day to my parents. Bill, but then being there, I saw how cool it was to see managers walk around. I love that he knew my chick, my sister loved chicken Havarti's entree and couldn't have gluten with it or whatever it was, right? So I thought that was so cool to have this relationship and interpersonal um, relationships with members, with staff, and all that. So that kind of spurred my interest into going to hospitality, where then I started working clubs, which you heard I've been in clubs for about 15 years, and now I've been with club bench working for about six. So it's a lot of fun for me to be in this position. A, I love, as I keep mentioning, I love that relationship that we have in clubs. It's so um, familial, right? It's, co it's collegiate, it's awesome to be there. So as I do these surveys, which I'm well over capturing over 100,000 member server responses in the last five years. I've worked with close to 150 clubs doing this. I feel like I still have that connection. Just yesterday, I was reading a comment about how terrible the ice cream cone is at one club and how it should get Trader Joe's um, ice cream cone. So it's um, pretty interesting all the way from something minute to that to bigger picture of what, what members truly want us to be and how to move forward. Uh, so here, I'm, you know, I'm going to explain first some of the aspects of our surveying, what we've learned from it truly. As an organization, the majority of you in this room, your main goal or purpose is the member experience, right? That's all you're here to do is drive the best member experience for your membership, right? It's not necessarily to maintain home values unless you do have that gated community aspect, but still, that's not the number one point of a gated community. It's the member and the resident experience. So when we think about that, what is driving that? It's the expectations and the desires of the members that are joining the club and that belong to the club. And even given the most recent years where a lot of clubs have seen such a huge influx of new members coming in, those perspectives are ever-changing, the expectations are changing, um, all of that. So surveying allows us to create business plans, understand what the direction of the club should be going forward so that we can start to deliver on that. So as I said, do we know why our members are members, right? You may say, well, it's the golf course, or it's our tradition, or our stature, or it's how close our members are to the club, or it's legacy, whatever it may be, but do you actually quantify that? Do you, in your, uh, in your interviews, in your applications, do you actually ask why they joined the club? What were they thinking about coming here? And then actually seeing what's driving that. Oftentimes, it's not always golf, to be frank. Even for some of the nicest clubs that we have, or some of the best golf courses in the country, it's not always golf. It's social, it's dining, it's an opportunity for my family to use that. So do you really know why People want to come to your club. All that, that motivation drives that expectation and satisfaction, which we'll talk about. So are you offering a recommended package? Have you asked your members recently what we're doing, how we're, off, how we're servicing their needs uh, from there? We know that most clubs aren't. We are doing an annual survey right now. We do um, an annual governance survey, which we have about 600 clubs that respond to it as of this morning. And I think only 55% of clubs are actually surveying their membership on an annual or biannual or some basis, right? So that's a small percentage of that. And again, we need the data, we need the information to drive this business planning going forward. So when we talk about doing the surveys, right, what are we hoping to do with it? It's not just to put it out there and just say like, okay, we got your opinion and we're done with it, what not. No, it's we want to show you the value. Going forward with this pending recession of what may come or, what, or what's going to happen, Having and creating value in our clubs is going to become so more important, right? When people are starting to face higher, uh, higher restrictions of their money, their inflation, maybe the market going down, what are they going to lose? What are they going to give up first? Is it the club membership or is it something else? Is it going out to eat less so that they can become members or stay members and belong to your club longer? All of these are things that we need to be cognizant of going forward so that we drive that value. We'll talk about today that you are not in a, you know, clubs compete on value, not on price or offering. And we'll, we have data to prove that. It's up to, it's about the value that you're driving, the experience you're driving. That's what makes members stay members of your club and want to continue to belong and, and join your club going forward. It's not if your dues are $100 or $1,000 less than the club down the road. It doesn't matter when you're delivering value. 
and, and you're meeting that expectation for our membership. So when you're doing surveys, again, how do we build this into our business planning? How do we create strategic plans around it for the board members in the room? It's a thankless job. We know that. I know that from the survey that it's a very thankless job. We need to do better. You know, this is a quote from KKW. We need to do better about congratulating you when you get on the board, not when you get off the board. That just shows you it's flawed in general when that's the sense of it around it. Um, but the sustainability, right? Creating those business plans around sustainability. You may be on the board for two, three, six years, but in the end, it's up to your management team to drive sustainability and succession planning because of that cyclical nature that boards are. And that comes down to doing these surveys, doing strategic planning, incorporating that into your business plans. So I keep talking about why members why. If you have followed Simon Sinek, he's a great speaker, but he always asks why, right? Start with the why, and he has a great piece on Apple, right? When Apple came to the market, their biggest thing was we're not just going to create a computer that competes with ThinkPad or IBM. We're going to create this brand, this ideology, the best performing piece of machine that you can, and people will pay whatever they will for it. Right, perfect example, people get a new iPhone every year and it's no different, right? The new 14 is literally the same thing. Uh, maybe it's a slightly improved camera, but who needs that many, that those more pixels in it? But it's all about the idea that, that what we're driving to and achieving and what we want to have with that. It's the same for our branding and our vision for our clubs, right? People are willing to pay and join whatever if they get to be a part of that, that tangible experience. So learning that, is, he's a great speaker on um, understanding the why and driving towards that versus saying, uh, we're just gonna have the best golf course out there and that's gonna bring people here. It doesn't always do that like that. There's other things that always factor into what's important with that. Sorry, I gotta start my timer because I'll just keep going and I love this stuff. All right. Um, so when we talk about motivation and why, all that factors into satisfaction. And this is why we want to understand what's motivating people to do it. For example, I'm, we're pretty well traveled. As Club Benchmarking, which I failed to mention, they gave us a little bit of a mixed description, but we are a business analytics company, um, a data mining company for the club industry. We are probably in about 10 different clubs a, a week. There's about 30 of us across the country. I'm based out of Boston. You'll meet my colleague, Ken, after he's based out of Maryland. Peter's also up in Boston. Um, but when we talk about, so with all the traveling that I'm doing, you know, for me, expectation drives everything. So if I'm happy to be staying at a Motel 6 for whatever reason, and as long as it doesn't smell like cigarettes and the sheets are clean, I'm good, right? My $60 is met, maybe, maybe it was $30, whatever that is. But that's the expectation I have for a Motel 6. But if I'm staying at the Ritz in Naples, and I'm spending $1,200 a night, and there's not this origami elephant made out of towels at the end of my bed when I check in, I'm, I'm kind of pissed off, right? Whether they do that or not, I clearly, unfortunately, have never stayed at um, the Ritz in Naples, but that's my perceived expectation, right? That's the Ritz, it should do that, right? I'm spending $1,200 a night, that should be a part of this experience, but it's not. So all of that expectation drives your outcome, right? And so when we talk about that, you see the screen, past experiences, word of mouth marketing, all of that shapes what our expectation of this be. When you think about looking at your own club's websites, some of you that just have a login, right? You can't even see what the club does besides maybe scoping out some poor pictures on Google imaging, all that, that starts to create a perceived expectation of what you are. Whereas you go to another club, and there's nothing wrong with this, but if your first picture on your website is, we do weddings, here's pictures of our weddings, in our minds, it clicks that you are a banquet factory. You're not there for the membership. You're there to drive banquet revenue to overcome some of the cost. Right? So all of that, just your marketing alone, sets this expectation of what we're going to get. Ultimately, when your expectation, when the performance or the output exceeds what that expectation is, that's when you start to see that level of satisfaction. Right? When it's the other way, that's when we're going to start to see that dissatisfaction. That's what we're trying to monitor. Where, where is that expectation? Do you want us to truly be the premier facility in the area or whatever, you know, we've we've read hundreds of thousands of mission statements and no offense to anyone in the room if you have this, but there always to be a premier facility within the five miles of this club and all this, but truly, what are you living up to be? What is that expectation that you all in the room who are members want for your management to go out and, and um, achieve from there? All that ultimately drives if we're creating value and if we're offering an experience that members want to stay members at belong and also recommend to their friends to keep joining and, and keep supplementing our, our wait list. Uh, yeah, and it's incredibly complicated. I'm telling you, with the surveys that we do, there's a lot of factors into it too, right? We talk about tennis or racket sports, generally played by 20 to 30% of members at most clubs that we 
we surveyed with, but I was working with this awesome uh, tennis professional down in North Carolina, and she opened my eyes to, with racket sports, even though we, generally it's a less of an investment, unless you are a uh, racket facility or, or an athletic club or something like that, racket sports are generally less invested, but they require a wider breadth of people, right, to play, like golf, right? If we're gonna go out and play today, and I'm a, or sadly, an 18 handicap. Peter's a plus two, I'll throw him on the bus, I'll show him up there. But if Peter and I were to play together, I would get six strokes per hole, possibly. That's not the right calculation, but I would have strokes per hole. But Peter and I could still play together, right? We could probably compare scores, we could gamble on it, he could give me my money, what it is. But if you play tennis, pickleball, paddle, any of that, pedal, the new one that's blowing up now, besides pickleball, there's a whole new one coming in, so get ready for that. Um, you can't, right? A 4-0 USDA can't play with a 2-0 USDA because it's not fun. The 4-0 USDA is gonna dominate that 2-0, right? So these are all things that are, how it's so complicated to drive satisfaction. Another one, food and beverage, right? Every, if I did any of your surveys today, it would blow my mind if your food and beverage scores were better than your golf. I've only had two clubs in 150 where food and beverage was better than golf. And it's difficult, right? I, I love, this is perfect because I'm in a room of, I believe, New Yorkers, but for me, if my clam chowder is red, it's not clam chowder. I'm not eating your Manhattan clam chowder. I don't want your red broth-based nonsense. I want cream-based potato clam chowder, the real thing, right? That's my perspective as a Yankee, as a New Englander. I can't say Yankee, but as a New Englander, that we're arguing over one soup dish. You're maybe not arguing, but I'm arguing over that, right? And that's just one menu item that we want more menu variety and rotation, all that. That's why food and beverage is so difficult to generate higher levels of satisfaction, but again, it's something that we need to focus on. It is generally one of the top three most important things in our membership, but it's always often the lowest scored one. And we don't know why, because we haven't solved it or figured it out and we aren't putting enough attention to it. Uh, we're focusing on the wrong metrics around efficiency and making money in food and beverage when it should be treated like an amenity like golf is. So, and then digging deeper, now this leads into our next topic of the net promoter score and the loyalty. So going beyond satisfaction too, right? We want to talk about your level of engagement, your level of attachment, how likely are you to recommend a club. This is um, a metric called the net promoter score. If you've heard about it, you've, if you've flown Delta, if you've um, stayed at a hotel, you've got a follow-up questionnaire about how likely you are to recommend X, and we're going to talk about that. But sad, the loyalty and engagement goes beyond satisfaction. A perfect example is during the pandemic, a lot of city clubs had to close down. Right? They didn't have the outdoor activities like you all maybe have the room where you had after the three or four months of complete lockdown you were able to offer some golf and some racket sports and whatnot. I just, I, in my head, I remember when they said that there was COVID that could go on um, tennis balls. I just thought of that, that was so random. Um, but for you all that was able to offer that, you were able to keep engagement with your membership, whereas city clubs that completely closed down, especially in NYC, they couldn't open for a year. And you had members saying, maybe many of you in the room, why am I paying my dues for something I don't have access to? Right? And that's that idea of that engagement or loyalty. If you think like that, you're more a customer, right? You're not seeing the sense of value. You're not seeing that you're still paying for the staff or the property taxes or whatever it would be, even though you don't have access to it. So we want that engagement and that loyalty. It goes beyond satisfaction. I say another example is if we go down the road and you have a meal and you end up having an undercooked salmon, you're probably not going back to that restaurant, right? <laughs> kind of poor, you don't mess with fish. Uh, but if you're at the club, and God forbid this ever happens, it probably doesn't, but if you have an undercooked salmon at the club, you're going to go to the food and beverage director and say, hey, off night, I uh, just want to let you know, but I'll probably be back tomorrow with my kids or my family or I'm golfing or you'll see me in three days or whatever it is, right? That's that sense of loyalty and engagement where even if there are some ups and downs, you continue to be a member. So we want to capture all that, right? This is important because, again, I can't harp on it enough that the end goal of your organization is the member experience for your members, the collective members. So when we talked about this net promoter score, this was created by Bain & Company, one of the largest consulting firms in the world. What they did is they asked on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend whatever it may be? Uh, then they asked a number of satisfaction questions throughout, maybe another 100 or so. They captured tens of thousands of survey responses, and they did this process called factor analysis, where they found that people that answered zero to six also answered negatively throughout the survey. People that answered seven and eight on this score, it answered similar, kind of positive, not, you know, kind of in the middle. People answer nine and 10, extremely ecstatic, positive throughout. It blows my mind to this day how consistent it is. I'm telling you, I've been doing this for five years and it's still, I'll pull, I can pull it up right now and it's, it's wildly consistent. So you get your score by taking the percentage of promoters 
subtracted by the percentage of detractors to get your quote unquote net promoter score. You essentially drop the percentage sign. So this is a great quick metric to understand that level, that sense of engagement, that sense of loyalty that you have in your club. And you can look at it by all different demographics and we're gonna show where we're not servicing or meeting needs for some of our future members. But this is a great quick easy metric. And again, it's, um, it's wildly telling. Some of the things, I won't spend too much time on it, but ultimately you can see it, it's driven by all different industries. Um, perfect example, and I hope there's no exception here, but a perfect example is um, Delta Airlines, before the pandemic, was rated one of the number one airlines, according to Wall Street Journal, for the metrics they were looking at. They have an NPS of 45. Comcast Xfinity has an NPS of five, right? Now, like to be dealing with your in-air provider, it's a pain in the ass. So it's really reflective of the organization and the, the people you're working with. So you can see it by all different industries. And you do have this. And the other things too, and uh, knowing my time, when we look at clubs who focus on this and, and customers or clients, those that do focus on this, they see a higher return and higher revenue driven because of staff are more engaging. So in our study, we looked at uh, members, so our survey responses, people who answered their age and also uh, their tenure in the club. So we ended up boiling down to about 56,000 responses. You can see the breakout there by all the different generations. We chose just to use generations as a good framework um, to look at it. One thing too about this is our average age in the study is around 65, which we have an average age for the industry, any and all clubs around 40, about 59. So our average age is a little higher in this. One reason for that is there's a larger percentage of gated communities in this subset. I just want to be clear with you about the data that you're looking at. So there's a there's 30% of the clubs in this are gated community where typically it's about 20%. So those are just some little caveats. But uh, when we look at this, overall, we see that for the industry, we have a net promoter score of about 46, 47 from there. So we're doing okay, right? That's something that if you're doing this on your own, you're looking at a 44 or 46 in your own club, that's pretty good. Best of class is a 60. If you do that, great is over 50. Best of class is over 60. Our best score is at 84, which we think is a little caveat. They've got some angel investors that pay for everything, so I'd love to belong there too. Um, but our lowest score is a negative 16, and that's a pretty well-established club that we work with too. So it's all over the place with these scores when you look at this, uh, but that's a good benchmark to use going forward. So what you see here on the screen is on the top, we broke it out by tenure, uh, which you can see there's not too much of a difference. Typically when we are doing this, you'll see that the newest members are usually the highest at that honeymoon phase. They're still loving the club. They haven't parked in someone's spot yet who's been parking there for 30 years and been yelled at. Um, you know, all those little nuances are kind of all the same. And it usually goes down a little bit as tenure grows, um, but some of the same. Sometimes you'll too see more tenured members, which doesn't always correlate to age, but often it does. Uh, their score tend to go down a little bit too because that value proposition is going down, right? So they're golfing less, maybe they're just dining. Dues and fees are going up on an annual basis as they should be as a best practice. So all these things you start seeing. What's alarming is when we look at the generational difference down on the bottom, you can see that uh, it's a smaller percentage of people, but the greatest have the highest silent boomers and then it just drops from there. What's scary about this is that we know from a company that worked with McMahon Group that the average age of members joining the club is 47, right? So that's that older millennial, the elder millennial generation is now coming into play, right? They're the next biggest generation and they're starting to join clubs and they're gonna be the next with the life cycle economics, but we're not doing well meeting what they want. They have one of the lowest scores when we look at this, also the Gen Z, Gen X, and the boomers. So this shift of new members coming in with different families want something different, and they want improved facilities, they want technology, they want convenience. Maybe it's tea times, right? If you still, if you don't have tea times, they want tea times. They wanna be able to plan out their weekend and not just go hang out at the club because they don't have all day. These are all little things we're seeing that's changing and it's clear in this data that we're not servicing the needs or expectations of our future members and the members coming to join our club. So understanding that and looking at it, and I'm not telling you to go build a whole kid playground and do all this unless your membership wants that. I'm not saying that that's what you have to do to be successful, but you need to be cognizant of what every demographic and what everybody wants at our clubs going forward and understand that, right? Again, it's about sustainability. And we keep talking about this pending recession coming up. What are those? Those are going to be the members who are pinched the most with, at least in Boston, healthcare, or sorry, um, uh, I don't have kids, but um, why can't I think of it? Daycare costs being exorbitant in Boston. It's like three grand a month just to have one kid at the age of 10, maybe even higher in New York. But all of those things are going to start increasing. Does the club membership still fit in their place?
So that's a quick bit, and I'm gonna jump into, do we actually understand what's driving this, right? So now we know that we're not servicing our needs. Do we focus on the right things, the strategic governance for those board members in the room? Where are you thinking? Are you thinking of the future, or are you immersed in operations, right? That's the hardest thing to pull yourself out of as a board member is trying to be a fixer. We work, and I know uh, we do multiple board retreats like, like everybody else in the room, where when you find most board members, you're type A, right? You, you're there to fix things. That's why you've been successful. That's why you're volunteering to do certain things. You're active. So if a member comes up and is like, we need to paint the barn, you're probably running to grab the paint and painting that barn. Because you just want to help, too. You want to help the manager, right? And, and save some time because they have so much on their plate. But that's not your job as board members, right? You need to be strategic in nature. And you need to think about the future going forward. In your own businesses, would you run your business like we do clubs? Absolutely not. Right? Would you have your board members come on every three years different and have a new president every one to two years if you have one-year term presidents? That's a nightmare, to be frank. Right? There's zero sustainability with that. By the time you're onboarded as a new president, it's April and May, and you got six months to try to do stuff, and then you got a new president coming in. So we need to be strategic in nature. We need to know the business model as board members going in. And again, it's, we as an industry have done a poor job of creating best practices of educating you all and educating our, our own managers on what true strategic governance is. All of this plays a role into what your member experience ultimately drives. So, do you know what the business model is of clubs? Is it widely known? If you don't, one of you or a new board member is gonna come in and tell you what it is, right? We love to be, well, there's so, one of the best things about clubs is that there's so many great people. You can have the most successful plumber in the world and you can have the CEO of Exxon Oil in the room and they can be on the board. Right, totally different walks of life, and they have ideas about efficiency and what, what we should do, but neither of them have either worked or helped create, or sorry, helped drive a nonprofit organization. That's what's so fun, because you work with incredible people like yourselves in the room, but how do we all come to the table in an agreement? You know, we believe in data, right? Our whole company's around business plan, around data management. We, have, we capture financials from 1,000 clubs a year. We capture, capture, capture payroll from 500 clubs a year, all of that. So, perfect example or perfect quote from um, the CEO of Netscape, right? If, if we don't have the data, or if we have the data, let's look at it. If not, let's use my opinion, right? Everybody comes in with opinions, and if you have, it's hard to argue against someone's opinion when you don't have the data to back up your argument. Same for them, right? So bring data into the conversation. Bring that into the boardroom so you can help drive that forward uh, because we want sustainability in our clubs. This is one concept that we preach. It's called the, the footprint concept. So this is a club right from the get-go. Did anybody think, God forbid, think about the expense of heating those pools? If you did, you're in the efficiency sense, right? You are not a strategic, in the sense, you're thinking, man, how do we cut costs on this? This is a club that back in the 50s, they made the choice to fund their footprint. So they understood that we need to maintain our facilities and we need to pay for it as a membership so that we're not catching up all the time. And look at what they have. They have a credible, they have about 2,000 plus memberships or families, but they said, oh, you know, people want to be able to swim laps and also enjoy the pool without being splashed on, we'll build you another pool. Oh, we have swimming, we'll do that. Because they had the money and they had the facilities and the plan and sustainability to be able to drive that. This is CCV if anybody's ever been there. And please know that I'm not telling you to go build three pools right now, but they listen to what their membership wants to be able to expand on this. They, not shown in this picture, is a beautiful 9,000 square foot fitness <coughs> facility and also not shown this is another campus with another golf course. But this is an idea where they thought, let's be strategic in nature, let's fund our outcome and our footprint so that we are driving that experience for our membership. Ultimately, it's a fixed expense. And we're gonna talk in the next few slides, if I keep up, um, about how expenses aren't bad when we look at this. Expenses are not bad to have our industry. They're actually, the adverse of when we have higher expenses per member, you have a better experience at your club. And we have that through data. This is not my opinion when I share this. So there's two prevailing things, right? There's the efficiency view, and then there's this make this place great view. There's always, and I, I don't mean to pick on the board members of the room, please. I, I do you no know harm or I mean no offense to, to what we're saying, but there's always members that come in and say, we need to be more efficient. We come to the grill room, there's people standing around at all times. They're wasting, they're wasting our money, uh, or whatever it may be, right? We need to make money in food and beverage. We hear all those things. Those are constant debates in our industry. But we're thinking about the wrong thing, about what are we trying to drive? We did a study and we looked at it that it boils down to less than 5% of your budget is wasted on quote unquote efficiency. And that's ultimately around those people standing around or being open for breakfast. If you're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 
all day, you're going to lose money. And it's impossible not to. Breakfast is not a sustainable finance model of clubs in general. But these are the prevailing wages. And it always comes into boards when you have new boards come in that we need to be more efficient. We need to drive profitability. Um, we can't increase our dues ever again, right? If you are president of the AIT, came, comes on and didn't increase your dues for six years, you're only hurting the club going forward in the future. Right, that's that view of price and cost over value. We can't argue enough or tell you enough that you are in a value-driven business and experience-driven business. You are not a commodities business like nails or anything like that. So these are the two prevailing wages where we have the or prevailing perspectives. We're also on the other side is with, let's make this the best club we can. Let's create an environment that our membership wants because we know what they want. If, they, if you want us open three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we'll do that. Right? We need the staff to do it. It's a fixed expense. Are you complaining about the amount of back staff that are waiting there to receive your clubs when you show up? No. Are you complaining about the pro shop staff who have to be there all day even when it's raining? No. Those are all fixed expenses. Or having to mow our golf course? Why don't we treat the rest of the club like this as well? So these are constant conflicting perspectives that we always deal with. You is the total operating expense per full member equipment. Full member equipment is a way for us to standardize the number of members you have. So we take your highest paying dues rate divided by your total dues revenue that gives us a quote unquote full member equivalent because some clubs have 30 membership categories, some have three, some have two. Right, so this is the way to standardize it. So we take your total expenses divided by your full member equivalents and we get that line. What you see here is that clubs on the left, the far left, have the lowest number of members. They have the smallest initiation fee at 7,000. Their dues are only 6,000. And their overall capitalization or what they're funding for the club, they're heavily undercapitalized. And also their overall facilities is fairly depreciated. You can tell when you walk in, looks old, smells old, feels old, it is old, right? At those clubs, you can tell. We, you, the best is when you do a Google satellite imaging and you see the cracks in the pavement or the parking lot. In our minds, we're like, yep, they are not funding their footprint. Just a simple thing like that. Just looking at a Google satellite. So you see that on the left. Clubs with the lowest amount of expenses per members have a lower, uh, a worse, not a worse, but a lesser experience, if you will. And they're not generating that. Clubs in the middle, and you see how that goes up. The clubs that have the highest expenses per member, that's 21,000 on that, on that um, 75th percentile, have high, the highest initiation fee, have the higher number amount of dues, they're, capital, they're funding their club more, um, and they're fresher facilities, right? And so it's, we need to get rid of this view of efficiency and driving down costs and think about what do we want to do as far as experience and how do we deliver on that and what's the appetite for our membership going forward? It's clear. We can't be arguing about this stuff anymore. We know that 90% of clubs don't make money in food and beverage. The, the, and that's from a thousand clubs annually. That's going back at least five to six years. And that's not the case. And if you are making money in food and beverage, it's because you're driving, you're doing 40 weddings a year, which ultimately impacts the member experience. You can't park, you can't go to the restaurant, whatever it is. Or you're having outings every Monday, which if you're one of the clubs that you have to have a membership team or committee that goes out after outings on Tuesday to repair all the divots and all the ball marks, why are we letting these people beat up our club when it's, you know, we should be paying for it for ourselves? And we know, um, going a little faster because I'm getting close to my time, but we know also, just to show you that 70% of clubs, I believe that was 70, yeah, 70% 70 of clubs break even, right? So we're so hyper-focused on the operations as a board when it's a break-even <coughs> operation, right? In the end, you're going to be plus or minus 3 or 4% as, as a club <coughs> or an organization. So how do we be strategic in nature? How do we think of the future and get out of operations? You have some incredible professionals in the room, and I'm not just trying to get them to use us, but you have some incredible professionals in the room. Let them do their job and manage the club. Right? You hire them for a reason. As board members, let's think, what are, we, what are we going to be as a club in five years? What are we going to be as a club in ten years? How do we then go achieve it? Is it our mission and vision? Or did you create a street plan that's been sitting on the, sitting on the self, shelf, it's the best 20 grand you ever spent, looked at it three times, collecting dust? You know, let's incorporate this into our business plan. Let's understand what the business model is of our club, let's learn and educate ourselves and then deliver that to the membership so we have, um, so we can continue to drive forward and also not be challenged whenever we're trying to do things. Um, and again, the never ending debate of efficiency versus member experience. And please, tell, I'm not saying here that go take a case of avocados and throw it out the window. No way would I be telling you to do that. I'm not telling you to go and waste and not be proficient and, and think about those things, but again, don't get stuck in these. If your board meetings are three hours long, you got a problem, right? You shouldn't be in the boardroom for three hours long if you're drinking 
and you're having three bottles of wine before you can start the meeting, you're also not doing board meetings correctly, right? We should, if, unless there's a special thing, your board meetings should be quick, right? Committee reports should be there ahead of time. Everybody should come in, well read, presence for it, boom, 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 out the door in an hour and a half, unless something like COVID or a lot of clubs dealing with Hurricane Irma, uh, sorry, Ian um, down in Florida. So these are all things that we get so stuck in around this never ending debate, and it's it's exhausting as managers, right? Every, you know, we always joke that we're one president away from leaving a club. That's what it always is. We're one president or one board member away from leaving the club or having a miserable experience because we're not educating, we're not doing what we need to in understanding the business model of our clubs and what the overall goal and intention is. And then ultimately this drives, again, it's that we always we call it the MAGS, members against everything, right? No matter what you do, God forbid, if you raise my Tito's 25 cents, I'm out, right? We got those, that's about 10% of membership. You get the other 10% that are like, hey, if you want, I'll give you a million bucks, just go put in a new practice facility, right? And you get those people. But then about 80% of your members are the ones that just want generally a great experience, and those are the ones we're servicing. But all we ever hear about is the lower 10% who, God forbid, if you raise a single dime, I'm out of here. And we don't want you, just kidding. But um, that all you hear from them, or you hear from the other people, but we're not hearing from the collective perspective. And I would challenge you, and even myself, when you think about your own <laughs> social circle, if you are the most unbiased, friendliest person, you probably still only talk to about 100, 150 people at your club, right? With maybe golf leagues, who you're dining with, maybe racket sports, any of that. But you have 1,000 plus people who are using your club, so that's less than 20% that still is framing your perspective of what you should do. So all of this, right, it's that balance of who's making a decision, are we, are we driving this club going forward and understanding this small? Ultimately, and I got two slides, then you're up, Ken, I promise. Um, ultimately, let's keep it simple, right? This is our example of what we say is a good mission kind of vision statement. Yeah, we've read hundreds of these, and they're all the same. They don't actually drive your organization going forward. When's the last time you actually talked about, oh, our mission, are we actually meeting that? Or our vision, are we close to succeeding that? Or, right, your vision is always supposed to be somewhat non-attainable. But do you actually look at those, or are those just good branding for your website, and that's just what you use? your staff know what those are. So what we say is, there's two things to keep it pretty simple. One is creating the most compelling member experience possible so that your current members want to stay members and that new members are fighting to get in the door, right? It's, we go back to your experience being the number thing and then also properly funding our footprint of clubs so we can create the experience we need. We can also maintain this facility, right? This is a beautiful room um, that, we're, that we're in right now. I, don't, I know that I'm not worried that the AC is gonna go out any moment with my pending daughter's graduate, or pending daughter's um, wedding coming up. So one is it's about creating a compelling experience. That's your goal and mission. Can't harp on enough. And then ultimately it's about funding the footprint, right? Making sure we're maintaining the capital we're paying so we don't, aren't fighting over dollars or where we put that in the end. And I love, look at the green one down at the end. Is your, does our vision drive our budget or does our budget drive our vision, right? So when we think about that, is that if we are gonna be a top 100 club, right? What do we need to do to get there? No matter what, if that's our vision to be a top 100 golf course in the country, what do we have to do to get there? It doesn't matter the rest. Our dues are gonna be here, we're gonna do this, this, and this to get there. Or is it, well, we can't raise our dues by more than 50 next year, so, you know what, uh, manager, go cut some under and have less people on staff or whatever it is, right? So what's driving what your club is offering going forward? Is it the vision or is it your budget that's all, all, ultimately harping you? Lastly, if you've watched Ted Lasso, I, I tell you you should. It's, it's on Apple TV. It's a great quote here where, um, in the end, we ask you to be curious, right? Keep asking questions. That's why our company got started, is because our co-founder was sitting in the Greens Committee one day, they're arguing back and forth about what they should be spending on the golf course. And sorry if you've heard the story, but they're arguing about what should be spent on the golf course. He's just sitting there seeing this ping pong match go back and forth and all, but he said, how do you know how much we should be spending on the golf course? And then his buddy just said, well, Walpole down the street is spending this, so we need to spend more, right? That's, that's all that person had to frame what they should be doing. So it's just a simple question was the birth of our company. And let's go figure it out, right? So we encourage you, this is a Walt Whitman quote, um, be curious, not judgmental, um, going forward. So I'm happy to take any questions. I know I'm a little over Ken, but, um, and then also we'll be here throughout lunch too. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you balance um, obviously funding the experience and footprint. Uh, part of that is the budget process or the annual operating how do you balance focus on that or not focus on that based on because obviously if 
your operating budget runs at a, a deficit compared to where you expect it to be, then the money you can devote to capital isn't, isn't what you like to do. So how do you balance the, the budget process with funding for capital projects? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So getting here, he, the question was, how do you balance where do you essentially allocate your dues money, right? So if you have your operating and you don't want to run too big of a deficit, how do you then allocate X amount of dollars to capital funding, essentially? What you need to do is quantify it. So there's things that you do, capital reserve studies, where you can actually quantify the depreciation of your assets. Everything has a, a useful life, right? The chairs you're sitting on, the tables, the carpets, all things like that. You can create a study that's 20 years and you can look ahead and say, okay, we have X amount of dollars due every year to replace these items with inflation built in. That's how you actually quantify so you know you're correctly funding it versus just saying, all right, we're gonna at least have half a million dollars go towards the facility. We know it's just under a million in general for an 18-hole facility. So it's actually quantifying it the right way so that there's not that argument for your city. Yes, sir. So our club, we have a, uh, a budget that we have to So there is a little bit, you can add a little caveat. What I say is if you don't know what they do want, then that doesn't matter at the moment, right? So let's figure out what are the next three or five projects or areas they want us to focus on. And then let's actually go figure out what the impact of that is or the project is on our membership. So that we can then go back to your membership and say, hey, we learned that these are the four things you wanted. You wanted fitness, you wanted golf performance, you wanted paddle, a uh, new paddle hut. Now, this is actually what it's gonna cost us, the impact it'll be. So you need some direction and treat it exploratory, and then it is a process. Whenever you, if you've undergone capital improvements, it's a very, it's not a simple process, right? You need to bring, you gotta make members feel like it's their idea in the end. So it's first figuring out what they want to have some direction as a long range planning committee or a board, then figure out what the expense or what that impact will be on the club, go back to the membership, share that, and then re-poll and figure out, again, where that priority is. So it is, uh, but once you do get down to with clubs that we do capital project surveys, unless there's firm dollar figures, I say don't put them on there because a member is going to challenge you. If you say it's going to be a half a million dollars and it's a half a million dollars and one cent, that member is going to come up and be like, you said it was a half a million dollars and challenge you with it. So do not put anything out there unless you want to be quoted on uh, from there. Good point. Yes, sir. Uh, this is data about like surveying the members, and I'm curious how uh, data is being used on how users or members are using the club, right? Everything from the food to the golf to the, to the, uh, the pro shop. And, and just kind of a, 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 a statement on what you've seen as kind of best practices for that, to use that also as an indicator of membership, like almost like a persona on how they are using the club. Yeah, absolutely. All that plays into it. We know, um, so we're gonna, we're gonna be doing some recent, or some, we know for food and beverage, for example, right? Because people tend to go to lunch more at their club, they look for some healthier options often. You're not gonna, you may, but most likely you're not gonna get a burger every meal at lunch, right? You're gonna mix it up. So we know that usage at lunch, there's a different perspective of what you want versus when you're at dinner, you expect more of a high touch point process, right? So at lunch, you're, what's your meal, what do you want? Server maybe comes around three or four times. Dinner, they're touching the table 10 times, right? And you want those more, saucy dishes, if you will. Saucy dishes are going out, but you want some of those. So you're right, that usage does play a lot into uh, what that expectation is. We know from our surveys a lot of capacity. Clubs are dealing with a lot of capacity issues, either T-sheet compaction, uh, group fitness classes, racket sports, all of that, and that's playing into a lot of clubs are asking, do we want to lower our membership cap? Right? Do you have the access to be able to get to the club, or are you frustrated with how often you're getting there? So we do, we do ask your usage to see 
if it's shaped by how frequent or not frequent you're going. Yes, sir. If we're sitting in this room in, in five or ten years, what do you think um, the critical topics are going to be that we're not discussing or that aren't on our radar today? Uh, so year-round facilities, that's, another, that's a big one coming up, and there's a Golf Digest article with um, Mike Smith's colleague, Tom Walsh, and that around golf pros and how they're starting to get frustrated that we're doing year-round facilities. But So younger members want a year-round experience, right? If you're a young family here and the club is only open six to seven months a year, they're frustrated because they, in their mind, they're paying for a full year. They want to be able to use it, um, unlike members who are transient and maybe going back and forth. So in their mind, they're like, I'm going to use it for six years. Those dues are equivalent to me. So I think the year-round, we're seeing a big, and then the casual, casual food and beverages, that will just not stop when we want the, um, you know, the uh, Capitol Grill style bar, 20 person, 20 person bar is too big or too small. You build a 20 person bar, it's still not big enough. But so I think the casual nature of clubs, the year round facilities, and it's it's ultimately where the money's going. So if I'm spending this money, I want to make sure that I'm getting that value out of it. So I think those are probably two of the biggest things. What about on the challenges side? Those are the amenities. Yeah, challenges, uh, diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, which we talked a little bit about earlier, and um, NCA does a lot of great work on that. But that's going to keep coming up. It's an undercurrent in all of our surveys, and that's not necessarily saying for every three members that come in, make sure there's a person of color, essentially. But it's how do we combat and be proactive in this subject that's going to be coming to our clubs and challenging us. Augusta is a perfect example. Like everything that Augusta does for the community around them is to overcome that they really only let women into their club 15 years ago, or whatever it was, right? A very short amount of time ago where they started to do that, but they are not going to necessarily change their traditions, even though women are allowed. Um, but they're doing a lot to build up Augusta and everything around them to overcome that. So diversity and inclusion is going to keep coming up, and that's going to be a big challenge going forward. And staffing's not going to go away. We know, especially for areas like this, maybe, or, you know, we work with clubs in Hilton Head and Naples. If you're a club on Hilton Head, your staff most likely don't live on islands, so they're driving 40 minutes to get on islands. Who's going to do that when gas prices are high or you're not paying them? Same with Naples. The majority of staff probably don't live in Naples. So, um, and I, I, you know, with our workforce too, I think people are becoming less. They have less sense of pride. So, how do we excite or get more involvement around working these tough jobs? So, I, I think that's another major challenge.